This podcast is brought to you by the American Enterprise Institute. If you like what you hear, please subscribe, rate, review, and share. Thanks for listening. Here's our show. What in the hell's going on? What the hell is going on? What the hell is going on? <laughs> I don't know what the hell he's talking about. You don't have to know what the hell is on it. What the hell's the matter with these guys? We don't know what's going on. What the hell's going on? Who in God's name knows what it's all about? <laughs> Hi, I'm Danielle Pletka. And I'm Mark Thiessen. Welcome to our podcast, What the Hell is Going On? Mark, give me some good news. Well, what the hell is going on? Here's the good news. We're talking today about the myth of MAGA isolationism. So there's this perception out there that the MAGA movement is embodied by Marjorie Taylor Greene and J.D. Vance and all these neo-isolationists uh, voices on Capitol Hill, that they want to withdraw from the world, that they're less hawkish, less interested. You got the Heritage Foundation saying that we need to put defense spending on the table to reduce the deficit and all the rest of that. They're pandering to all these MAGA voters thinking that that's what they want. That's not what they want. The, the Reagan Institute has just done a poll, their summer survey of, of opinion on foreign policy. And I went through, with the help of our outstanding producer, Ben, who pulled all the numbers in the crosstabs on MAGA Republicans versus non-MAGA Republicans. And on every single issue, MAGA Republicans are more hawkish, more concerned about human rights, more concerned about uh, U.S. leadership on the world stage, more concerned about victory in Ukraine, more concerned about defending Taiwan, more concerned about defense spending, more concerned about helping and willing to help Israel than general Republicans out there, the non-MAGA Republicans out there. Does that surprise you, Danny? Well, so, you know, it's really interesting. I think just to put this in the sort of Washington vernacular, the political conversations we're having right now are about Donald Trump voters and Nikki Haley voters, right? What is the talk of the town? The talk of the town is Donald Trump needs to choose a vice president. And wow, he would be really smart to choose Nikki Haley. He'd be really smart to choose somebody like that who will bring those voters back. Okay. And the bottom line is that, and, and I will confess to you, I don't think I knew this either. The bottom line is actually Donald Trump voters and Nikki Haley voters actually largely believe the same things. And in fact, some of the views that we most closely associate with Nikki Haley, especially on foreign policy, right, that she's, you know, super tough on China, big pro-defense, really big on American global leadership, really big on things like NATO, for example, and our standing in the world. Actually, Donald Trump voters, self-identified Donald Trump voters. In other words, this is not Danny Pletka making this up. This is out of their mouths. Actually believe the kinds of things that Nikki Haley talks about even more intensely than quote-unquote traditional Reaganite Nikki Haley voters, which to me is a giant headline. It is. It's and and it's just we've been following a false narrative. They're concerned the non the non MAGA Republicans, the Haley voters, their concerns with Trump were not about foreign policy. <laughs> they were about other things. And he does need to win those voters over, but it's not on foreign policy that's the way to get them because what he needs to do is follow what his voters want on foreign policy, which is greater U.S. leadership on the world stage. You know, I thought I think it was instructive in 2016. We had we talked about this after the 2016 election where we were concerned. Was this a a rejection of American global leadership? Right. And it wasn't. I, I think one of the things we came to the conclusion of is that it wasn't a rejection of American global leadership. It was a rejection of the execution of American global leadership. Right. That people. What was what did Trump say over and over again? I'm, Americans are sick of losing. Americans want to win, right? And they want strength on the world stage. And so when Trump says Putin would have never invaded Ukraine if I was president, and Iran and Hamas would have never attacked Israel this way if I was president, we can debate whether that's true or not. I think it probably on as likely is. But that's the kind of thing that these voters say, yeah, you're damn right. They, they're, they're concerned about Biden's execution of, of these policies. They're concerned that there's no strategy to win the war in Ukraine. There's, there's no strategy to, to deal with China. But it's not that they want to pull back. They, they want a president who's going to be strong on the world stage, who's going to exercise American leadership on the world stage. He's not, not afraid to exercise American military might. They want the Donald Trump who 
whacked Qasem Soleimani, bombed Syria twice, you know, and told the Iranians that if you retaliate, I've got 52 sites picked out in honor of the 52 hostages, and I'm going to hit you hard like you've never been hit before. That's what the MAGA movement wants. They don't want the isolationism of Vance and Rand Paul and and Marjorie Taylor Greene. In other words, the self-appointed red baseball hat wearers are in fact misrepresenting what their viewers, voters, and listeners actually believe. And this is, you know, what we were talking about when you told me to save it for the podcast. I was ranting, <laughs> per, per usual, I was, I was ranting uh, about this question of the victory of the loud over the true. And f- for me, 2024 has been the sort of the apex of this problem, which is that the loud, not just among the sort of the Tuckers of this world and the J.D. Vances and, you know, Josh Hawley's of this world, and sadly, some of the people at the Heritage Foundation as well. It is, and by the way, also on the left, right? You know, the MSNBC, the creepy Mehdi Hassan, who finally got fired from MSNBC, but the haters and the shrill extremists, they actually don't represent their movements, right? Most Democrats actually support Israel. Most MAGA Republicans actually want Putin to lose, to do more for Ukraine, to see them win. And and the fact that nobody challenges these self-appointed spokespeople, spokes trolls, I'm, I'm going to copyright that one. The fact that no one challenges these spokes trolls and self-appointed leaders is a big part of our failing in Washington. We need to spend the next six months taking those people down. So one of the one of the other findings of the poll which I think is fascinating is that how effective actually explaining to the American people what's at stake is, right? So in Ukraine, support for Ukraine is pretty much unchanged in since the last poll 6 months ago and the, and the last poll 6 months after that about half of Republicans support giving aid to Ukraine, but then if you go and start making arguments to the uh, the uh, American people, and they tested a bunch of arguments. One of which was providing aid to Ukraine allows us to weaken Russian military capabilities without risking American lives. Aid is inexpensive compared to overall military spending. This is something we can afford. The United States should be the arsenal of freedom. If Ukrainians and other words around the world are willing to risk their lives for freedom, then we should give them weapons they need to protect themselves. When you start making those arguments, support for providing aid to Ukraine increases significantly. And I was particularly proud because I did this deep research on uh, the fact that 90% of the aid stays here at home and it's actually creating U.S. jobs. That was actually the number one issue in moving overall support. 39% moved to support aid to Ukraine if you made that argument. But even among Republicans, it was even more so. That's why the J.D. Vances of the world responded so so violently to it and started uh, arguing back. But we got a president who doesn't make these arguments. That's that you know that that's why we've got stagnation on this. I, when I was in the Bush administration, you know, President Bush didn't let a week go by without explaining to people what was at stake in the war on terror and asking them for their support. And we've got a president who never asks for America's support or explains to the American people what's at stake in the battle. Amen. And now, having previewed the poll that we're talking about, done by the Ronald Reagan Presidential Foundation and Institute, we should welcome back. Roger Zakheim, who we had on to talk about this last year. The findings of this poll are absolutely fascinating. Roger's the Washington director of the Ronald Reagan Presidential Foundation and Institute. He previously practiced law at Covington and Burling, where he led the firm's public policy and government affairs practice group. He was, prior to that, general counsel and deputy staff director of the U.S. House Armed Services Committee, and he was also a deputy assistant secretary of defense. In other words, he has tons of experience and knows whereof he speaks. Here's our interview. Well, Roger, welcome back to the podcast. Thanks for having me back, people. It's great to be with you. It's so great to have you. So I want to get into the whole overall foundings of the poll and where the American people are in foreign policy, which is very, very promising. But I want to drill down on something that I saw in looking at the numbers. So you break down a lot of these questions between in Republican versus Democrat, but then within the Republican Party, you break it down between MAGA Republicans and non-MAGA Republicans. And what I was shocked to find is that on virtually every question, MAGA Republicans are more hawkish 
the non-MAGA Republicans. MAGA Republicans are more in favor of defending Taiwan. MAGA Republicans are more in favor of NATO. MAGA Republicans care, care more about human rights and democracy than non-MAGA Republicans. What What is going on here? This is not the story that we've been sold. I was surprised, Mark, actually. And the reason why we want to get at you know this kind of thread was we were asking, we are asking all these questions that we do every time we do the survey on America's views towards American leadership in the world. And we thought, okay, well, we can't just ask the traditional how you identify party line, Republicans versus Democrats, but we are told, you know, and Dan and I were talking about this before we got on the show, that we have to look at the different threads within the Republican Party, the neo-isolationists versus the internationalists. And so we said, okay, let's see how those who identify as MAGA Republicans versus non-MAGA Republicans respond to these questions. And it's pretty eye-opening, as you point out, that actually they that is a MAGA, a self-identified MAGA flank of the party, really believes in American leadership in the world. And if you break it down across some of the issues you just spoke about, Mark, they're in some respects more hawkish than non-MAGA identifying Republicans. And so there's a lot there that I think will be surprising to those who probably get their news off of social media or the tropes that you know some of the networks tell you, you know, to believe. Well, I mean, so we've heard that this election is breaking down, at least on foreign policy, between MAGA Republicans, the Trump base, which is more isolationist, more populist, uh, less interested in international engagement, and the Haley Republicans. Nikki Haley campaigned on American leadership on the world stage, supporting Ukraine and all the rest of it. And that doesn't seem to be where the electorate breaks down. That that the I, I don't know if you can equate non-MAGA with Haley voters, and it's probably slightly different, but the non-MAGA Republicans are not more for more international engagement, and the MAGA voters are less. I mean, have we gotten this whole dynamic and this whole description of where the Republican primary electorate was wrong? It's certainly making me revisit it. And I think what's going on here is a reaction towards President Biden and President Biden's leadership. And to the extent that you find Republican voters less enthusiastic about American leadership in the world, less enthusiastic about supporting Ukraine, you both have written about this and, and think deeply about it, I think the hesitation or the lack of support comes from who is occupying the White House, not because there's some deeply held ideological view that as a Republican, I want to build the walls very high. I don't want to look beyond it or engage beyond those walls. That is decidedly not where conservatives, Republicans, MAGA or not, want to be. They have deep reservations about President Biden's leadership and the ability to lead the United States in the world. And I'll make one last point here is that you see that play out, Mark and Danny, in the questions that go to, are you concerned about the United States kind of being brought into a war in Europe, being brought into a war in the Middle East? There you find conservatives, Republicans, MAGA, non-MAGA, really kind of showing numbers that suggest, hey, whatever we're doing in foreign policy, let's not get embroiled in an armed conflict. But to me, that's more reflection of the concerns about President Biden than it is about a worldview. Roger, per usual, this poll is just, first of all, it comes at a critically important time. And second is like a the fresh air of reality versus the 200 plus letters of garbage that are represented by our public political zeitgeist. First of all, I want to give you an opportunity to give us your sort of top lines, what leapt out at you, what is absolutely not the CW in addition to the sort of, you know, lack of a real MAGA, non-MAGA divide. But I also want you to talk a little bit about finding that I was really delighted to see, which is who wants Putin to win the war in Ukraine? So uh, tell us your headlines and and add in that, that little Putin yeah, detail so too. To me, the big takeaway is one we just hit on before, which is Americans overwhelmingly want leadership in the world, and they want that leadership primarily to lead with American strength, military strength. I mean, the numbers there, and it's consistent with our previous polling, is like somewhere close to 85%. So that's Republicans and Democrats, and, and Republicans there are like over 94%. So they think about American leadership in the world, they understand that our military, our leading in security is a guarantor of our peace and prosperity. The NATO piece, I know I'm sure Mark's gonna wanna jump into this a little bit, is also super interesting. Americans support NATO. Here we are about to enter it's, you know, the 75th anniversary of the Washington summit. All these world leaders are coming to Washington. There is strong support for NATO. But at the same time, there's this very interesting thread that whereas they would support, I believe, close to two-thirds of Americans, hey, backing up a NATO ally who's attacked 
via Russia, given our Article 5 commitments. At the same time, Danny, they do not want to support NATO allies that aren't meeting their 2% threshold. So, you know, what you hear President Trump talking about, it's not something he's dreaming about down in Mar-a-Lago, isolated from where the American people are. It's reflective of where the American people are. But then to your last point, Danny, I'll wrap up with this. It's a very small number that want to see, you know, that somehow views Russia as kind of the party here that should win and sides with Russia. I mean, overwhelmingly, Americans want to see uh, Ukraine win. They believe that that's in the interest of the United States. Although, as we see, they don't believe right now that Ukraine is winning. They see Russia as winning. Right. And the, the numbers are just stunning. The common trope that, that Republicans want Putin to win, 8% of Republicans prefer that Russia win compared to 7% of Democrats and 7% of independents. In other words, you know, there's within the margin of error, even less than the margin of error. Uh, yeah, Tucker, about Tucker's not persuading anybody. Well, let's let's go through the poll subject by subject and talk about where people are. And let's start with Ukraine. One of the things your poll found is that basically Republican support for Ukraine is unchanged since in like the last three polls, I think it is, that you've done on this issue. Talk about where the American people are and where the Republican Party is on Ukraine. Yeah, the Republican Party continues to be just about half in terms of supporting Ukraine, supporting sending weapons. You know, there's 75 percent of Democrats and a plurality of, of Republicans. And again, that goes back to a point I made earlier. I think the hesitation on the part of the Republicans is in part driven by President Biden and his policies, because overall uh, there is broad support uh, for Ukraine and the recognition. I think like 75 percent of Americans say, hey, it's, it's in the U.S. interest for Ukraine to win. And then when you give them additional information and you know, Danny and Mark, you both have worked on this, but we continue to. See, what happens if you provide respondents with arguments that would impact their, their support for giving Ukraine aid, it really does impact uh, their support. So if you talk about kind of dominoes, you know, lose Ukraine, it's going to lead to escalation in Europe and perhaps attack on a NATO ally. Then it jumps to 71 percent. Republicans see a bump there as well. Uh, there's a value. Hey, if Ukraine loses, then, you know, kind of defense of sovereignty and respect for sovereignty goes down. You get increasing support, and you know there's value in terms of degrading, Rus degrading Russia's military capability because they're an adversary. It goes to 66 percent. So we consistently see that when you give them more information, and we've talked about this before, Mark and Danny. In other words, if you make the case, if you tell people why you might want to be supportive of Ukraine, right? Because of all these arguments, because as as Mark, have you written, you know, it increases capacity and jobs in the U.S. It actually has an impact on the way the respondent views the question and says, you know what, I'm actually more supportive of giving aid to Ukraine. And so what this section in Ukraine that stands out to me is that if you just leave the American people without giving information, they're kind of generally supportive. But if you add arguments in favor that just appeal to common sense, they become a lot more supportive. Uh, what, one of the things I found heartening was I did a big essay, in the, several big essays in the Washington Post, pointing out that 90% of the aid stays here and is creating jobs here at home. And that was the number one issue in terms of moving people away from opposing aid to supporting it. That argument, it tells you why J.D. Vance and the other ones have been so pushing back on that argument. But that number and degrading Russia was, I think, second behind it. The fact the domino theory was behind that and defense of sovereignty. Those are all, you know, conservative arguments. Uh, if you make conservative arguments for engagement in, in support of uh, Ukraine, it moves numbers. Again, so that, that goes back to this point about making the case. I mean, if you're not telling people, why should we expect people to support it? Particularly because it's not a kitchen table issue for them yet, right? They'll, of course, be captured by the border crisis, for example, or, you know, inflation. And so they put those issues against the Ukraine that isn't explained by the commander in chief. It perhaps not gonna be persuasive, but if you just put one, you know, a sentence or two in a poll, it jumps significantly, as you point out, you know, with 57% more likely to support aid to Ukraine if they know that it's increasing U.S. industrial capacity output. So let, let's talk a little bit about why it is that the facts suggest that the American people are, to use the phrase that, that Mark always uses, reluctant internationalists, right? The facts suggest that when you use the bully pulpit of the White House or congressional leadership to explain that support for an internationalist agenda rises, support for American leadership, why is it, I'm sort of asking you to actually just 
just speculate with us. Why is it, therefore, that this counterfactual, right, that conservatives are isolationists, that Republicans are isolationists, that the trend, the trend line, and this I think is hugely important, that the trend line of the Republican Party is sort of 1930-esque isolationism, you know, that our leaders are all the new Father Coughlin's. Why is this the prevailing view among intellectual, political, academic, and press elites? So I think there's a point you made earlier, which uh, you and, and Mark are expert in, which is, hey, how is kind of the media kind of playing this issue set. They're trying to put things in strict binary form and kind of those that make the most noise get the most play, even though they're not reflective of, of where the people are. So I think there's that. But there's also something in the poll which I think contributes to that. I mean, one of our questions that we talk about American leading the world, we ask, hey, do you believe the U.S. is better served by withdrawing from international affairs and focusing more attention on problems at home? And you see that, yeah, there's about 62% that agree with that statement, right? Uh, that does reflect their point of view. They want to focus on things at home. But that's not the end of the story, Danny, right? It's an and here, not an or. And that's something we f emphasize a lot at the Reagan Institute. Sure, we got to focus on things at home. The American people want that. And that's a priority, the common good, right? But at the same time, those same respondents can say, hey, not just 62%, 86% would say a strong U.S. military is essential to maintaining peace and prosperity at home and abroad. They recognize that. Or 78% of respondents would say U.S. leadership and engagement in international events is essential for promoting trade and boosting our economy. And, and, and here I think some of the craftsmanship of our questions are important. Embedded in the questions is some sort of statement that demonstrates it's in the interest of the respondent. It's in the interest of the American people. And when you, of course, craft questions dealing with U.S. leadership in the world to what is within U.S. interests, they tend to be supportive overwhelmingly, you know, a, a two-thirds or more. Right. But the prevailing view among the liberal elites that run the commanding heights of American press, American academia, a lot of American business, and of course, American politics on the, the Democratic Party side, is that America is a country not simply with original sin, but fundamentally, we are a small country. We're a country that has no right to tell people what to do on the global stage because we are so morally flawed. Not just that, but we are a country that is incapable of doing anything right, so we can't chew gum and walk. In other words, we can't address domestic issues and foreign policy at the same time because we suck. Yeah, and, and, and that mentality, Danny, you know, the we suck mentality is plaguing the far right in our country and the far left, but it is fundamentally not reflective of the views of the American people, the overwhelming number. And that's what's so great about this poll. You know, we talked about this last time, but one of the reasons why we spend the money on this to get the experts to do it is because Reagan fundamentally trusted the views of the American people. And when there was an issue that needed to engage the American people, he trusted he can engage with them on it and persuade them. And we kind of take that legacy and invest it in this polling. And I'll read one that we, you referenced earlier, but I'll, I'll play it out again. When we ask them, hey, the U.S. has a moral obligation to stand up for human rights and democracy wherever possible in international affairs, right? Hard to argue within that framing of the question. There's some sort of, you know, self-interested hook. 77% say they either strongly support that or somewhat support that. That's Republicans and Democrats, MAGA, non-MAGA. It just shows an overwhelming view on the part of American people that we have a role here that is to do good for ourselves and for people around the world who share our values. So of that, on that question, 74% of MAGA Republicans agree with that, only 69% of non-MAGA Republicans. Those are both super majorities. That's a five-point increase among MAGA Republicans. Same, similarly, on a strong U.S. military is essential to maintaining peace and prosperity, 79% of MAGA Republicans, only 66% of non-MAGA Republicans think that that's important. Overall, do you think U.S. involvement with international events is mostly beneficial to the world or mostly harmful? 61% of MAGA Republicans say it's beneficial. 55% of non-MAGA Republicans say it's beneficial. I mean, this, these are, you know, fairly stunning statistics that are so contrary to the conventional wisdom. Yeah, and, and I'm, I'm hopeful that if there's a Trump too, a second Trump administration, one thing we know about President Trump, he knows where his voters are, he knows where his supporters are. 
that he looks at the this polling because what I think is happening here, and you know, this is not reflecting the poll, but my own sense of of looking at these issues, the dynamics in the Republican Party, is that the kind of the base, those people that are voting in primaries, those people that you know are attending the Lincoln dinners in Republican clubs across the country, you know, perhaps you know they they don't share this worldview. But they are a very small slice of MAGA voters. They are a very small slice of the 70 plus million people that have voted and will vote for President Trump. And you want to get at that share of the Republican electorate, you see, Mark, where they truly stand on this issue set. Roger, we haven't talked a lot about about issues relating to the war in Gaza. And again, if you were merely reading the New York Times and watching CNN and getting your news from TikTok and Twitter, you would think there is a massive partisan divide on questions relating to Israel, questions relating to Gaza, Palestinians, the conduct of the war by Israel, the role of the United States, and attitudes towards anti-Semitism. You would think Republicans, yeah, go, go Jews, go Israel, crush them. Democrats, Jews suck, we hate you, you know, Columbia students are right, Hamas should totally win the war, we need a Palestinian state now. This is, uh, if I may use the term used by political scientists to describe this kind of thing, um, (laughs) bullshit. And your poll really lays that out. Could you just draw out some of the really interesting statistics about these questions from um, from your results? On on Israel, you're really not seeing this Republican-Democrat divide. Uh, To your point, Danny, Israel has a right to continue military action in Gaza until it has removed the threat posed by Hamas. 46% support that. Israel's military action in Gaza has gone long enough. It's time for a ceasefire. 43% agree with that, right? So you do have this divide there, but it's not along party lines. It's what uh, you know, others have, have emphasized when it plays out in this poll. What you really see is the under 30 demographic. That, if you go into the crosstabs, that's where you see what's driving these numbers. You know, do you support or oppose U.S. sending weapons to Israel, for example, Danny? You, know, you have roughly close to 50% just under 50% that would somewhat oppose or somewhat or strongly oppose sending weapons to Israel in that under 30 demographic. Everybody else, right. 30 or over, you know, it flips. They're far more supportive. Similarly, I'll give one other to you. And this demogra- demographic point is obviously consequential. It goes to the college campuses. You know, which comes close to your view, right? You have the under 30 demographic. Israel's military action in Gaza has gone long enough. It's time to, for a ceasefire. 53% of those under 30 agree with that point of view. That's what's driving it. But 47% don't agree, which is even well, more stunning you if you that's, consider well, what's going on. Well, that's fair enough, on. right? You def- good point. It's it split. I guess my rea- the reason why I'm framing it that way, Danny, is because those who are 30 and older truly you know, believe that Israel has a right to continue military action, military action in Gaza, right? And, and, and think that, hey, this is a terrorist organization you know, that's bent on destroying the state of Israel, and they're bent on destroying the United States if they could— we stand with Israel. That's the predominant view of those 30 and over, and the, and the poll bears that out. Again, I'm going to, because I'm drilling down on these numbers, I'm writing a column on this, so I'm, I'm pulling this out. On Israel, MAGA is much more supportive of Israel than not, non MAGA Republicans. So, on the question, Israel has a right to continue action in Gaza until it has removed the threat posed by Hamas, 72% of MAGA Republicans agree with that, only 65% of non-MAGA Republicans. Do you support or oppose U.S. sending weapons to Israel? 75% of MAGA Republicans support that, including 52% strongly support. Non-MAGA Republicans, only 57%, with only 29% strongly support. On the question of, do you support or oppose sending U.S. missile defense systems to Israel to help it defend against attacks from Iran? 81% of MAGA Republicans, 73% of Republicans overall. Do you support or oppose Israeli counterattack against Iran? 73% of MAGA Republicans do, 61% of general vote. I mean, these are, these are some of these are very significant divides. Yeah, no, no doubt. You're contrasting it between the MAGA Republicans and the non-MAGA Republicans. Yeah. That's interesting, but I'll take a 73% any day of the week, you know, from the non-MAGA Republicans. Sure. What I would love to match it up to is MAGA Republicans versus Jewish voters. <laughs> in the United States, because uh, it seems to me 
uh, you will find a far more uh, supportive Zionists amongst the MAGA Republicans than perhaps you would see amongst the Jewish electorate uh, on this issue set. Now, we didn't ask, we, we didn't break it down that way, but that would interest me. Perhaps we'll do that next go around. You got another poll in, uh, <laughs> in, uh, coming out in December, don't you? That's right. We, we do. I'll make a note now. No, you're exactly right, though. Although I think that, you know, what you really want to see is is the change, because I'm willing to bet that in the face of this explosion of anti-Semitism, the waffling of the of the Biden administration in the face of support for Israel, in the face of, you know, the equivocation over, quote, Islamophobia and anti-Semitism and always wanting to pair those two, that a lot of people in the Jewish community have basically said to themselves, you know what, I'm done. And this is certainly what we yeah, hear Yeah, that makes sense to me. I mean, it could be that at, at once they will vote for, for Biden in the election but at the same time saying, hey, this is ridiculous. You know, we got to have full-throated support for Israel against Hamas and their kind of neo-Nazi sympathizers here in the United States. You know, one thing we didn't include, if I just take a quick second on this, which I regret, Mark and Danny, is we did not include in the poll a question about concerns or view towards what the United States should do with respect to U.S. hostages held by Hamas. And as, as you both know, we have uh, five U.S. hostages. U.S. citizens are held by Hamas in Gaza. Three uh, Americans who were, who were killed and their remains uh, are believed to be in, in Gaza, too. And uh, one of the just colossal failures of the Biden administration has been that they have not done anything. Uh, that really stands out on behalf but of U.S. The, citizens. Roger, you don't understand. You don't understand, Roger. They're not Americans. They're Jews. Because that's the only thing that explains this. I, what I really pray and hope is not the case, but it's my, my fear is that there's two classes of, of passport holders. One that is a U.S. citizen and one that's a U.S. dual citizen, United States and Israel. And, and the five U.S. citizens in Gaza, of course, are dual citizens. But it's, I think there are other factors at play, Danny. I think it's, they don't want this issue on the table. They don't want to have to deal with the fact that there are, that uh, a two-bit terrorist organization is able to stare down a, a superpower and hold their citizens and make us, you know, basically just, just look weak. So just not talk about it. And hopefully that won't be a vulnerability of Biden administration. I, I think that's a factor too. Let's turn to your uh, findings on China. What, what did you find overall when it comes to U.S. and Republican foreign policy views on China? Well, I think not much has changed since the last survey with respect to China. The overwhelming kind of takeaway is Americans don't feel that we have a coherent or clear strategy on how to deal with China. And, and this is where I think the instincts of the American people, this kind of notion, trust the American people. They actually have some insight on the, you know, the so-called sophisticated elite domain of, of foreign policy. Actually, they're on to something, right? We, are, we don't have a coherent approach on how we deal with China, given its it's, you know, kind of growing military that is really, I think, achieving military superiority over the United States, an economy that is challenging us economically. They're, they're boxing us out around the world. I mean, you just look at recent reporting on, on you know, the, the China's presence in, in Peru and, and the you know, Western Hemisphere. I, I think that's reflected in the poll. And then what we've seen really since the Trump administration was in office, a recognition that China is the threat. And that really hasn't changed. I went through these again to break down what are the issues where sort of there's a, more of a split between MAGA and non-MAGA Republicans, because you went through a list of all the things. What are you very concerned about these issues when it comes to China? 80 percent of MAGA Republicans are concerned about human rights violations compared to 74 percent of non-MAGA. That's not that huge a split, but it's something. China surpassing the United States as the world's biggest economy. 85 percent of MAGA Republicans are concerned about that. Only 67 percent of non-MAGA Republicans, but the one that really surprised me, concern about the isolation of Taiwan, 71% of MAGA Republicans are very concerned about that, only 59% of Republicans generally. And when you ask, should we increase U.S. military presence near Taiwan to discourage China from invading Taiwan, do you support or oppose that? 67% of MAGA Republicans support doing that, only 55 just over half of, of non-MAGA Republicans do. What's with the MAGA support for Taiwan? Yeah, I, I think this is, I guess, our, but there, there are some elements within the MAGA group which say, hey, this reflects the idea that we should, you know, pivot to Asia and give up the rest of the world, I, you know, the Middle East or, or Europe. I think that would be the wrong takeaway. Again, this is not some sort of endorsement of moving all our national security and defense focus to the Indo-Pacific and saying we don't have an interest in, in, in Europe. But it, 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 it's consistent with what we talked about earlier, right, in terms of recognizing that American prosperity and, and peace 
you know, really relies on American leadership in the world, beginning with uh, military presence. That 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 is, is the anchor. The Taiwan piece in itself. I mean, some of those numbers, Mark, outperform where the American, you know, kind of where the total respondents are overall, right? So in terms of isolation of Taiwan being, you know, a, a top concern, that's sixty eight percent were either uh, very concerned or somewhat concerned, and then the military buildup is. The, here, interestingly, the Republicans underperform, whether it's MAGA or non-MAGA, where it's about 82% that either are very concerned or, or somewhat concerned as well, or would support it in the case of military buildup. So in some ways, Republicans trail. And I think, again, this is a reflection of Democrats being supportive of Biden administration policy. Right. I mean, this is the thing, you know, it used to be, and again, we've always seen partisanship. We've always seen attitudes change, right? So the Obama administration was completely soft on Russia, wanted to do the total reset. And then as soon as Trump was elected, they were like, Russia is our enemy. You know, we must kill them all. Sanctions sanction sanction right and and you know that that flip was entirely politics based what is interesting is that we have seen an evolution on china where at the beginning of the biden administration both republicans and democrats were like well if there's one thing we agree on it's china and now you do see this this divide where democrats are are softer on china and that ability to move to you know to to move action on China has suddenly been more limited. It's a little bit troubling. Uh, so it, one of the things that's really interesting to me on the again the political side is okay we got Congress to say ByteDance, the parent company of TikTok, needs to divest. Either that or TikTok will be shut down. You know, huge support for that, and now all of a sudden Biden's on TikTok, and so is Trump. <laughs> And so is Trump, right? I, I will say Trump has way more followers uh, than Biden on TikTok, which is kind of funny. Considering um, he's been on for but, like a week. You know, <laughs> but, but I mean, we see, right, we see we see support for, for banning TikTok has gone up 10 points, right? How do you sort this out so for us? So I'll hit the TikTok and I'm going to come back to the broader point on China and American views on China. Americans are using TikTok, you know, and obviously we know younger people are using TikTok. So it, this is a, a harder sell and it's impressive you know, sometimes the polling, you know, you see a political players following the polls here. TikTok is one where we have good, responsible legislators, right, who understand the threat and are leading on it, despite the fact the electorate's not with them. Think about the 41% of Americans support banning TikTok compared to 44% that oppose a ban, right? So here you have a case that, and you just have to kind of look at the issue set, go a little bit deep, and you see the threat opposed and how, how TikTok as, a, as an app you know, social media is just collecting at a rate that none of the other social media uh, apps, you know, collect to know that this is a real problem. But to a point made earlier with respect to Ukraine, it applies here at TikTok as well. When you give them more information and you say, OK, but there's potential national security and privacy concerns concerning the app, it jumps by 10 points. That 41 percent goes to 51 percent supportive of the ban. OK, so it does reflect that the opposition to the ban is somewhat soft. And there needs to be more done on the part of experts and, and public intellectuals and elected leaders explaining what the problem is. That probably means that those running for president shouldn't be on the platform seeking your vote. I mean, it probably cuts against the support to your point. Danny. Again, breaking down MAGA versus non-MAGA Republicans. Do you support banning TikTok? 63% of MAGA Republicans support banning TikTok. 30% of non-MAGA Republicans support. That is probably the biggest divide between MAGA and non-MAGA Republicans in the poll. And then when you press them about the, the national security experts' concern that Ch China could use TikTok to gather personal information about American citizens and influence opinion, 67% of MAGA Republicans support banning it. Still only 43, less than a majority of non-MAGA Republicans. What are, what's going on with the TikTok Republicans? <laughs> We're gonna put that in the poll next time. Are you a TikTok Republican? You know. My sense is those are the hardcore free traders. Let the market work work its will and don't give me this national security sort of thing. It isn't the, the under 30 demographic. I mean, there's a separate cross tab worth, worth inquiry there. Uh, but my sense is, is that these are people that generally uh, don't want you know, the government going and interfering with, you know, the kind of libertarian, my choices in the market and, and you know, uh, don't, don't bother me with this TikTok problem. I, I do think that on China, the American people have this, this overall concern. And they're doing that despite the fact that the, the policy is muddled, right? In this respect, there's an opportunity for 
whether it's Trump second administration or Biden second administration, to actually strengthen U.S. support if there was some clarity with respect to Taiwan, the Chinese military buildup, to what decoupling right, or de-risking actually looks like. If, you, if this policy had some coherence, I think more people would get behind it. And I, I worry, actually, that the more we kind of dither and, you know, we're sending mixed messages in terms of what we want with the People's Republic of China, what is our view of President Xi, then we're going to see these numbers start to, to slip. Why is that a problem? Because once China chooses to act, once the PRC chooses to act, be it in Taiwan, the Philippines, or in some other domain, right, the American people won't be where they need to be to support a president's determination, hey, we need to act here because they haven't been cultivated and developed. And I think that's, that's a bit of a risk. I a question for me. You know, again, you're talking here mostly about foreign policy. So generally speaking, U.S. presidential elections do not turn on foreign policy, except after 9-11. You know, after 9-11, we saw a presidential election where foreign policy issues were consistently polling among the most important. But now we are hearing increasing whispers that actually this election may turn more on foreign policy. If you just take a step back from your poll and think about previous polls, think about intensity and enthusiasm, what do you think? Do you think foreign policy is actually going to be more important than it traditionally is in the 2024 presidential I, I think it should, but I don't expect it to, unless there's some sort of October surprise. And Interesting. I, I just say one, one, one more quick thing about this. I'm not going to look to after 9-11, which I agree, but if you look at 1980, right, when Reagan was running against Carter, there very much was a emphasis on foreign policy and national security, a real palpable sense in the electorate that they had two different choices and, and America was at risk of decline and losing to the, the, the Soviet Union in, in a number of different ways. And despite the fact we think of that election as where Reagan said, hey, famously, are you, you know, better off today than you were four years ago, right? Very, there was very much a discussion about what posture the United States should take vis-a-vis -vis the Soviet Union, and that mattered in the election. I think that's probably the better parallel analogy for today. The, the candidates should be focusing on this. I, I think so, too. Are you safer now than you were four years ago? He, he had the whole litany, right? Are you better off now? Yeah, you're right. your, uh, can you buy more than you did four years ago? Does your money go as far? Are you safer now? And then 84, there was the famous bear in the woods ad as well. Yes, there was. So, so <laughs> yeah, the Reagan election's foreign policy played a bigger role perhaps than at any other time. But that's because the candidates wanted to mark. The, the candidates, particularly Reagan, wanted it to be. You don't see uh, President Trump actually taking advantage of what otherwise I think could be a very a good elect kind of political opportunity for him on this issue. So. Well, so here that leads me to my exit question. So, Roger, I write my column. Trump reads it. He's very intrigued by this poll. He invites you down to Mar-a-Lago to present your findings. What is your message to Donald Trump based on this poll? What do you want him to know? Take your time and make a few points if you want. But what do you want? What, Mr. President, here's what I want you to know about what we found, about where your movement stands on foreign policy and where the electorate is. That's a bit of a fantastic scenario, but I'll play the game, Mark. Here we go. <laughs> I, I think it's really just a... Welcome to Mark's yeah, world. It's a sentence here. People will tell you that to be a MAGA voter means to be a, you're some sort of build the wall and you know, turn away from the world. That's actually not where your voters are, Mr. President. Your voters support you because they view you as a strong leader and they think you'll make America strong. And this poll demonstrates that a MAGA voter wants America to be strong in the world because they understand that when America is strong and leading in the world, it accrues to their prosperity and peace and lifestyle they want in America. That's the key message from the poll and that's what you're seeing from the MAGA voters. From your lips to Trump's ears. Well said. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Well said. Exactly. Thank you, Roger. This is such an incredible service to the country that you guys do. I I love it every time it comes out, and I learn so much. Thank you, really. For, God bless for the Reagan. That's a great compliment. This. So happy to be with you guys. I think Roger needs to go to Mar-a-Lago. <laughs> I think we need to get Roger down there to brief this poll to the pre to, to President Trump because 
I, I think these are generally his instincts. You know, I did a column last week laying out the fact that Trump is not the isolationist the isolationists think he is. I don't think he's a Reaganite internationalist. I think he has a very realist, hard-nosed views. I don't think a lot of Reagan's messages about freedom and democracy resonate with him. But he's willing to exercise American military might on the world stage. When I look at someone like J.D. Vance, that he's even being considered for vice president, J.D. Vance would have advised Donald Trump not to do everything that he did on foreign policy in his first term that made him such a success. He would have. He definitely wouldn't have been supporting uh, taking out Qasem Soleimani. He definitely wouldn't have supported bombing Syria and, and all the rest of it. So we got we got to let Trump know that his voters actually support his foreign policy. <laughs> yeah. No, I agree with you. I think that's I think that's the right thing to do. And Mark, even if we can't persuade Roger or President Trump to, to to have a meeting, I think you need to you need to tell people this. This is you know what it is important to keep repeating the truth, and uh, because that's that that will set us free. You know, the, the, <laughs> the, people have gotten used to telling lies to the American people about what Americans really think, about what Americans' role in the world should be, and a little honesty is the best policy. Amen to that. Let me say, let's close by this. Thank God for the Reagan Institute. Thanks for it's so great that Roger Zakheim is leading it and doing such a great job and asking these questions that no other pollsters are asking. I learned something from things from this poll that I had no idea were true that I hope that I hoped were true, but I had no evidence were true. And now I've got the facts, and I'm really glad I have them. Amen to that from me. Thanks everybody for listening. Take care. See you next week. Let us know what topics you'd like us to cover. You can get in touch with the show by emailing us at whatthehell at AEI.org. Or you can reach us on Twitter. I'm at D. Pletka. And I'm at Mark Thiessen. That's Mark with a C. Please rate and review the podcast. If you like the show, please subscribe, share it, comment on Apple Podcasts, or wherever you're listening to this. Thanks for listening. Thanks for listening.